Have you ever wondered what the strongest chess openings are to play as white and as black? Well, if you would like to play these openings, well, this is the video for you. As I'll be showing you how to play both e4 and d4 in the strongest ways as white, I'm also going to be showing you the best defenses to play against both of these first moves. Does that sound good to you? If so, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And remember, hit that red subscribe button to subscribe to my Grandmaster Chess channel. So with that being said, let me give you my Grandmaster insights on the best ways to play. And of course, I'll be focusing on the best moves. You know, there are so many different chess openings. Yes or yes. So I'm going to be focusing only on the moves that are really the strongest according to the theory. There are a lot of old terms that we won't have the space to mention, but I always welcome your suggestions in the comments below for what openings I should cover in later videos that you want to learn more about and to master. So after e4, we're going to start with the move of c5, as this is a most common reply to e4, especially, but let's say, in that middle level below, the very top level and the beginner level. And against c5, the main move is knight f3, and there are basically three main branches that black can go for. The one I would say is the strongest if pressed is the move d6. I'd rank that in first place. Uh, I'd put knight c6 a close second and e6 a somewhat distant third. So I'm going to start with d6, which this doesn't have a name yet because there are still a lot of different lines that black can play against the open Sicilian, which is what it's called when white goes d4 and opens up the center like this in order to use his lead in development. But black in turn also has his central majority as a long-term advantage to play with. And now the main line here is the Knight of Sicilian with A6. And A6 might seem like a bit of a weird move, you know, aren't we taught in primary school not to push our Rook's pawns or get a slap on the wrist like that? Well, A6 is actually a very useful move in this position. As, let's say, if we play Bishop E3, which is the main line for white and considered a critical continuation. Well, now black is able to play E5 without having to fear a move such as Bishop B5 check a Knight coming in. And the pawn a6 is also useful in the long term for eventually preparing a pawn break like b5. So this up where white plays f3, and let's say we take some position like bishop e7, and both sides casting opposite sides. Well, we can see that black is ready to play his queenside attack, whereas white with offside castling has own kingside pawns, so with g4, g5. And it's a very mainline system that of course is played a lot, and continues to be played a lot at a high level. In fact, the modern mainline is in fact not to just develop naturally this is the old main line but the modern main line is to play h5 a weird looking pawn route but basically stopping the g4 g5 plan and forcing white to come up with another plan so just putting knight on d5 but okay if i went any deeper the video would be 10 hours long so you'll have to settle for this overview well i point out there are alternatives such as the skaveningen approach we're putting the pawn e6 instead which is not as good as e5 but it's not outright terrible either and there are also other moves that white can play with the main moves being things like bishop to g5, trying to go for an f4 and e5 direct attack. Moves like bishop e2, which is a more quiet classical approach, developing pieces more steadily. And there are also other trendy moves like h3, where white tries to prepare a g4, g5. Then these moves also have a right to exist, though bishop e3 is kind of the main move among the equals. And as worth pointing out that black's alternatives are not really considered as critical, like knight c6, Bishop g5 is a very strong rouser attack, where white gets kind of an improved English attack in some cases. Or if black goes for a dragon with g6, again, it's sad there's a little bit passive if white just goes for a long castling and the king side attack, which of course is a very common theme for this setup, yes or yes. So for this reason, this is kind of the reason why you normally see the knight off at a high level if black goes d6. And if white wants to avoid the knight off, he'll often play to move bishop b5, going maybe more for a positional setup with castles and thinking about maybe playing c3 and d4 to prepare the break, or so I'm playing c4 and playing like a Somorachi bind. But these details fall outside the scope of a quick overview like this video. And if they play knight c6, usually at a high level, the move knight c6 is connected with a line known as the Sveshnikov, where after d4, take, take, knight f6, knight c3, where black plays the move e5, and accepts the weakening of the squares, on the d-file, but in return the knight gets kicked around and is often forced to quite a bad square, which sort of makes up for the weakness of the d5 square. And these positions are ones where white has recently been playing knight d5 as an alternative to the old mainline bishop g5, though in general black position is quite playable. And it's one of where engine gives a small edge, but at the corresponds level people figured out the ways to equalize for black. 
Which is one reason why actually the main trend at a high level is not to play to open Sicilian, but it's the one case where white actually normally goes bishop b5 to Ross Lima at the top level. Kind of a similar idea to d6, but the difference is that you get this extra option. Then you can also play bishop c6 and double their pawns for a nice small strategic advantage. Black normally goes either g6 playing it in a dragon style, or the move e6 is also sometimes seen. And those are the two main ways in which black tries to play for equality at a higher level, though I don't think he is 100% successful in doing so, in my humble opinion. And that is sort of the reason why I think d6 is a bit better, because it makes bishop b5 a bit less effective, you know, when you can play knight d7 and kind of make the bishop look a little bit silly for the moment. But that's a whole other story that, again, a bit outside our scope. And the reason e6 is a bit imprecise is that, well, you just go d4 and... And in these open slim positions, like if they go knight c6... I mean, the time on off with queen c7 and, you know, trying to go for this very flexible setup... It's playable, but I find that the modern lines where white goes queen f3 and sort of long castles queen g3, it's kind of like an improved English attack where the queen is more active on f3 than it is on d2, and that does give white a small advantage according to the opening theory. Also moves like a6, even though the canceling is very flexible, it gives white the option to play c4 either immediately or first play bishop d3 and develop the king's side and then play for c4. Black has a lot of options they can play, like bishop c5, knight f6 are the two main ones. But in all cases, white gets that extra space and a quite pleasant advantage according to the theory. Which is sort of the reason the reasons why you don't really see ace, e6 or high level anywhere near as much as knight c6 or d6. And of course, there are different anti-salians white can play. The anti-salians alliance where you don't play knight f3 followed by d4. So there are moves such as knight to c3, uh, of course, playing a closer ceiling with some g3 or f4 ideas. F4 being a Grand Prix attack. And also moves like Alep and Sicilian with C3 and D4 that is more direct. But in these cases, it's not really considered as critical as playing Knight F3. And the same is true, by the way, for the other main move of E5, which is perhaps a move that most of you will be a bit more familiar with than C5, true or true, playing very classically. And once again, Knight F3 is the critical move. You know, stuff like King's Gambit. It was popular in the 18th, 9th century, but now people know that what doesn't really get full compensation for the pawn. Like knight free g5 is one good line, for example. So instead, they go knight f3. And black usually plays the move knight to c6 in this case. And here, white has a bit of a choice in this position. Again, I don't have time to go through every single little detail, but the main line for white, at least historically, has been the Roy Lopez with bishop b5. And if you have been following the world championship match between Carlson and Jan de Pomnesche, well done if you remembered his name. You'll know that they were playing this line with a6. Uh, with the Morphe defense putting the question to the bishop. Because why can't actually win that pawn because of some tactical reasons. Uh, bishop c6 is no, the exchange variation, by the way. But bishop a4 is the main move. And, and again, after castles, there are a lot of different options. I don't have the time to mention every single one. But bishop e7 is the main line. And you know, Carlson and Nepomnesi were basically having a big discussion of this martial line where black goes castles. With the idea that if white plays a normal c3, then you go d5 and, you know, you sack the pawn, but you end up getting very good counterplay and active piece play in return. And the theory has kind of shown that black basically achieves a draw without too much trouble if he knows a little bit of the theory from here. And that's the reason why Jan Nepomnesi in the match was playing some moves like h3 in this first game of the match, trying to avoid d5, but not so successfully. And then later he also played this a4 move, trying to you know, provoke some weakness in the structure, but again, didn't get that much of an advantage. But this is kind of the main approach you see at a high level to avoid the marshal with these kind of moves. Or a move like d3 you'll also sometimes see as a way to avoid the marshal. Uh, by the way, there are also other moves like the open Spanish with knight e4, or the Moller lines with b5, bishop c5, that players like Caruana and Ferrugia like to do. But again, it would be making the video too long if I were to so more than to mention this line. Actually, at the highest level, the move that is maybe at least as trendy as a6 is the Berlin. You may know knight 6 the Berlin is a system that Kramnik used in order to dethrone Kasparov in the 2000 World Chess Championship. And, you know, the main line is castles. And to basically play this endgame after d4, knight d6, not a easy move to find if you don't know the fury. But the point is that we are attacking the bishop. Obviously, if a6, bishop a4 is thrown in, that bishop wouldn't come under fire like so. But here we can take, and of course this position is not really 
you know, not really deep enough, like, the video's not long enough to cover it in depth, but essentially, because of black having his very strong light squared blockade and unopposed bishop, it, even though it looks ugly for black with the double pawns and king in the center, the black is actually doing fine, and the fury pretty much confirms that black is equalizing in several ways from this position, which is why at a high level you'll sometimes see white try to avoid this, you know, there's this peace sack at d5 that it's sometimes played as a way to make a quick draw, but I don't have time to go deeper into it. And there also have a safe approach like rookie one, where you try to play for a small advantage in a, uh, you know, in a very symmetrical kind of structure, saying the nice and ideal on d6. And there's also anti Berlin's like d3, where, you know, you just defend the pawn, and, you know, white has a lot of different approaches, like taking c6 or castle c3, depending on what type of position you want. Though in all cases, black is just rock solid and doesn't face any objective problems. And that's the reason why you'll often see players not say play the Royal Pairs all the time at the top level. But sometimes I'll play something like the Italian, which is a move that, if you're a beginner, you might face the Italian more often than bishop to c5, than bishop to b5. And there are different ways you can play the positions. I mean, there's a direct approach is where you go c3 and d4. But at a high level, you're more often going to see white play it with d3, you know, like this, or, you know, with castles, instead of the move c3, as it were funny just then like in the background of someone saying like wake up jeff wake up jeff and actually it's a good timing for this position because looking at this, you might think okay there's no way that white can be better when black is just so solid you know like d6 castles castles and i mean how has white got an advantage but it's a very subtle strategic point that in positions like this let's say if i play a tree now that black is castle the king and it's not going to hack our king like this well, I mean, in the old days, I used to play a6 and bishop a7. But then this a4 approach became trendy as a way to kind of make some look for the bishop, grab some space and fight for an edge. So nowadays, a5 is kind of considered the main line where you sort of grab space yourself as black and often will play moves like h6, bishop e6 and go for a very dark squared strategy. But again, this is sort of, it would be going to make a video too long if I went any deeper than this, but this is kind of the main trend of this modern Italian. And of course... They can reach me from different move orders, like black and also play moves like knight f6 if he wants to avoid things such as, let's say, c3 and d4, or avoid things like the Evans Gambit, which is not very good, but it is a line that does exist. But after knight f6, I mean, white is not forced to play d3 and defend the pawn. But also there is the move knight g5, like fried liver stuff that you do have to be ready for. You know, after d5, ed5, there's this pawn sack that technically is fine for black, but you kind of have to know what you're doing. Because obviously knight 5 is not the most natural move in the world. Yes, so yes. So that's kind of the story of bishop c4. And the other lines don't really have as good a reputation in general. I mean, probably the scotch is the best of white's alternatives. But it's kind of been worked out. And it's sort of quite telling that even though Jan de Pomerci used to play this as his main system as white. He didn't play in a match against Magnus Carlsen. Because he realized that, okay, the forcing lines with knight c6, e5 have just sort of been worked out to, to equality. Of course, you need a good memory to play this, because obviously, position is very sharp, you know, c4, bishop a6, like the pin on this knight and the pin on the pawn. Like, it gives a good example of, like, how messy and sharp it is, but the engine has pretty much worked it out to a draw, more or less. Which is not the most fun thing in the world for us, even if our opponents are probably not going to know every single detail over the board. Um, and also, knight c3, bishop b4, this scotch for knights also just very, very equal and not really anything for white here. So, okay, maybe I went into more detail in these lines than strictly necessary, but I think it's good to understand, like, where the Fury stands and how it's developing. Of course, the Petrov is also a line that has a right to exist, and actually Nepo used it in the match against Carlsen to hold some solid draws. So, of course, also an alternative that other players like Kramnik as well did quite well with. But anyway, instead of E5, there are some alternatives I will mention very briefly, though I do consider them a little bit weaker than the big two of E5 and C5 talking purely objectively. Now, I noticed that the French is one of these systems that has a big cult following at the club level, probably because of some quite popular authors recommending it. But I consider it slightly less precise, mainly because of the move knight to c3, as in slightly less precise in e5 or c5. Black has a few different choices, but none of them completely satisfy me. If you play knight f6, I find that the Steinitz version of e5 and f4 just gives white a small pull. Granted, at the correspondence level, they worked out that after c5, that if you play this poison pawn line with cd4. There's not the only move. There are other lines like bishop e7, a6, I do consider a little bit worse for black, but if black does play cd4, there's this line called the poison pawn Steinitz where you take b2, but 
you come under a very strong attack and you pretty much have to be a computer almost or have repaired very, very deep with a computer to survive. So practically it's not a lot of fun even though objectively black can defend and hold the draw. It's all the way chess works, you know. You can play a slightly weaker move but still be able to hold if you play correctly. Just your task is a lot more difficult than if you had played the best move each move. Makes sense? Well, also black has the winner with bishop b4 but in these lines as well you sort of see that black is having to give up a bit more than in some of the other lines, so you know, after a3, white is slightly better here because of he has this bishop pair. And yeah, the double pawns are a bit of a problem, but black's weak dark squares and white takes space, extra space is arguably more of an issue, according to theory. And finally, d4 is a move that I face quite a lot when playing club players, but pretty obviously if you have this extra space in the center, only white can be better. So like knight f3, bishop d3 is pretty easy to play. Uh, there are also alternatives. I mean, the, probably the best alternative for white here is the Tarash with knight d2, which has the idea that in some cases you can play like e5 and c3 and build a nice solid pawn chain. Like if they go knight f6, this is kind of the, you know, the idea that, you know, this pawn structure is kind of better and a knight is not really that great on d7 compared to, you know, the lines with the advance where you don't lose time moving the knight. Obviously that gives black more time to attack the center and that's kind of the reason why e5 is a little bit weaker according to theory than the two knight moves. But anyway, I've probably gone a bit too deep already into the French, and I guess I'll finally add the Karakhan. With c6 is the way that recently Ferrugia has been playing this quite successfully. However, I consider that after d4 and d5, well, I consider white just will play to move e5 in this position. For some reason, my computer is misbehaving and refusing to show the lines because it doesn't want me to refute Karpov's and Ferrugia's Karakhan for the 2022 World Championship match. But okay, these jokes aside, e5, I think, is the best move. With the advanced version, we grab a lot of space, and you can say that this is a much improved version of the French advanced version because, well, basically, they're going to have to play e6 at some point, somewhat, at some point anyway, if they want to get in c5 in a great version, yes or yes. And if they play bishop f5, this line is a short system with knight f3, bishop e2 is just thought to be a little bit better for white. You know, you, black can play c5, but then he's behind in development. But if he doesn't play c5, then how is he challenging the white center? And white, and I mean, bishop f5, the bishop looks nice. But the fact white's head development does give him a little bit of a pull here. Uh, there are, of course, other moves that have been played. I mean, for example, things like the tile variation is also an interesting line for more attacking players. And there's also other moves as well, like knight c3 is the old main line, going for a more Scandinavian type structure. And things like the exchange exist, and of course, probably the best alternative I would say to the advance would be the two knights with knight c3 and f knight f3. That was played by Bobby Fischer, for example, uh, in many times in the past when he was somewhat younger. It's line that probably also gives white a small edge, even if d4 and e5 is kind of the most common line. In any case, that sort of shows the, the different possibility of e4. I realize that there are other moves like the Scandinavian and things like the d6 period systems and the modern. And the Alec, you know, there are all these other moves that black can play, but the general conclusion is that white gets a pretty significant advantage against all of them if he plays correctly. And this is the title's strongest chess openings, not weakest chess openings. So let's continue on to the move d4. Uh, the thing with d4 is that it's such hard to speak of a clearly stronger system the way we can perhaps with the e4 lines, because d4 is a lot more strategic and there are a lot more different setups that both players can go for due to the fact that, you know, when we play d4 and c4, we keep the full flexibility of our structure by not blocking any of the pawns with knight uh, as such. And so we kind of have this crossroads after this where, you know, e6 and g6 are the main lines. And I'm going to start with e6 because there are certain complex transitional points that are good to understand. So let's start with knight to f3, because this is the the main line in this position at a higher level. But in this case, after d5, black is basically used a little move order trick, where by playing d5, he has transposed and the queen's gambit declined, where normally we'd see black going at, a, let's say, d5, and then e6 would be the normal queen's gambit decline move order. But with this move order, black has basically maneuvered white in a position where he's committed to knight f3, meanwhile he's lost a couple of options where he doesn't play knight f3, I can promise this will make a bit more sense as we go through some of the possibilities. But for now, let's just take this position and consider the main lines at the player's disposal. So the main line, if we include transpositions here, is the move of c6, building a nice triangle of pawns, which is known as a semi-slav defense. 
Now, before I show you the best way of playing against the semi-style defense, which, by the way, I consider to be probably the strongest chess opening on a practical level against D4 on average, do remember that you can comment below where if you see a chess opening that you think, I really want to play this opening, let us know, and, well, we'll see which one is the most popular of the strongest chess openings. But the semi slabs opening, I played quite a lot, and, of course, many great world champions like Anand, Kramnik, Kasparov, I think also Carlsen has played in some games as well. Basically, there are two main branches. The really sharp approach is bishop g5, which actually can lead to some very interesting lines. For example, h6, you again have this crossroads in the Moscow variation where you can either take on f6 and play it very positionally, where you give up the bishop pair, but you also get this space advantage and a bit of a lead in development because of the black queen being a little bit misplaced. Though, objectively, black does equalize if he finds all the right moves, which you can't really avoid it completely, yeah? Or the sharper approaches to go bishop h4 and play this very dynamic line known as the anti-Moscow gambit with e4, g5, where black basically is up a pawn, white stacked a pawn, but he gets a strong center. Lean development and black has also weakened his structure a bit with some of these knight pawn moves. I mean, you'll often have moves like h4 at some moment to knight e5 to try and use your lean development. Computers have sort of worked it out to a draw if black plays perfectly, but of course in a practical game, Odds of both sides finding all best moves such a crazy position are very, very close to zero. And black has other moves like dc4 and knight d7 that are, I consider, a little bit weaker than h6, according to the theory, where white gets much more chance of an advantage in these lines, at least on a practical level. But if these lines are a bit too crazy for you, there is also the move e3, which is a more positional approach. You know, in the old days, I used to play this line known as the Moran, where white would go bishop d3 and, you know, try to get an e4 break. Whereas black in turn would go b5 and try to prepare the c5 break in different ways. But nowadays the main trend is to be a bit more flexible and go queen c2 and then kind of, you know, choose your system after bishop d6. You know, bishop d3 is still the main line, but also other moves like bishop e2, b3 and g4 that are maybe slightly less precise objectively, but which can allow white to at least choose the type of middle game he wants depending on his style. And that's a thing we're going to see with a lot of the different lines and I realize I probably... We knew a little bit too much detail, but since the semi-slav is my probably favorite opening if I had to pick a single one, like if I had to play one defensive d4 for the rest of my life, it would probably be the semi-slav. Well, I guess it makes sense to share some of that passion, yes or yes. If they play classical queen's gambit with bishop e7, the main trend now is to play bishop f4, the blackburn variation where you get, you know, this active bishop and, you know, black can try different moves like knight d7, c5, or slightly inferior in my view as b6. But in all the case, white gets a small pull, and there are a lot of different ways in which you can approach the position depending on what type of advantage you want to get. Uh, but to go into more detail would make the video a bit too long. Uh, they used to play bishop g5, by the way, but now it's not really considered as, as critical by opening theory, because black can often trade off the pieces a lot more easily to get much faster equality. Whereas bishop f4 keeps more pieces on the board. But against the Rogozin with bishop b4, which is kind of the third major option for black other than semi-slav and classical. Well, white has a lot of choices, but usually it comes down to either playing bishop to g5, which in turn black has a few different options he can choose between, with h6 and the Vienna dc4 being the main ones. Well, this is one option for white, and also cd5, you know, playing this to release the tension and then put the bishop on g5 or f4 are kind of the main approaches nowadays. But it is true, you are also helping their bishop get more active, so it's not a completely free, let's say, insertion of CD5 in that regard. But the Rogozin has a pretty good reputation, and it's sort of a more active piece play way to try to equalize with the black pieces. And even now, White's not really managed to find a line that proves a clear advantage against this. And black does have various other alternatives. Moves like, for example, DC4, Knight D7, and especially C5 have been shown to be quite respectable, especially C5 is kind of a modern attempt to try to draw right out of the opening, kind of like a Berlin or Petrov. But that's something, again, I don't have the space to go into the semi here, except to mention its existence. But let's say if this range of options at black disposal might feel a bit overwhelming for you, well, the good news is that white can try to choose the type of the position it arises, and the Catalan with g3 is an attempt for white to more force his type of position on the board. Black has a lot of different options from playing bishop e7 and playing it very classically, like playing d take c4 and... Not so much to try to keep this extra pawn, but to try to activate his bishop while White spends time winning the pawn back with something like, let's say, queen c4, b5. 
and bishop being 7 being a good example. Or if a4 to go bishop d7 and... And it's been played a lot in opening period at top level. It's still a major battleground where black is able to equalize. But white always has this tiny, tiny edge because of this central majority that black has given up by playing dc4. Of course, black can also play dc4 immediately. And then he has a very wide choice of options here. The one that's considered the best by Fury currently is to play to move a6. Not just prepare b5, but also trying to prepare a move like knight c6 to challenge the center uh, like this. Because if black plays knight c6 immediately, there are moves like queen a4 that allow white to get the pawn back thanks to the pin and give white a very small advantage. And most of black's other old terms like bishop b4 and c5, while they are playable, they do tend to give white a small pull if white plays correctly, uh, which why a6 is sort of the best move here. And finally, the other approach that's quite trendy is to play bishop b4, where you basically aim for an improved version of the bishop e7 lines, as in the closed lines with bishop e7, it might look a bit weird to give bishop d2 for free, but the point is that now, if black plays something like c6 and knight d7, this is considered less precise with a bishop on d2, because white would go knight d2 and e4 and have a small edge. But as you can see here, the bishop on d2 is in the... Say it for me, in the way, that's correct. And so this line is considered quite respectful, where black can put the bishop on b7, or on a6, depending on his taste. Both lines do equalize if black played correctly. But that's sort of the options in terms of the Catalan, and there is also, by the way, the possibility to play on move 3, not to play knight f3, but to play knight c3 as well. But before I get to I will point out just quickly that there is also, d5 I think is the best move here, but b6, the Queen's Indian, is not so far behind. As in this case, after say g3, black can choose between bishop a6 hitting the pawn, or bishop b7 playing it more classically, like bishop b7 and castles and such. And also a3 to Petrosian version is another line that where white tries to go knight c3 and try to take over the central uh, dark squares without allowing bishop to b4. Uh, this is the reason why a3 is considered a little more precise than knight c3 and allowing you know, a transition to a Nimzo Indian. Which by the way actually leads us to the move knight c3 which does allow bishop b4 to Nimzo Indian. And the Nimzo actually is one of these openings that scores very well for black. White only scores about 51 to 52 percent in games. Which is a bit lower than the average of 54%, yeah. It's a system where both sides have a lot of options, and admittedly in this video I won't be able to show all of them, but I will point out that the main line for white is to play queen to c2. Notice the Capablanca variation with the idea of playing a3 and trying to get the bishop pair advantage, like in this line, for example. But where white also can choose other options, such as, for example, e4, is a very direct approach, and moves like knight f3 playing more strategically, also have their right to exist here. So queen c2 is quite a flexible move. And the same can be said for the Rubenstein variation with e3. Where again white can choose a lot of different setups. Again castles is the most flexible and strongest move for black. But white gets to choose the type of setup he wants. Whether he wants to play bishop d3. And something like knight f3 or knight e2. Or whether he wants to play let's say knight e2. And try to win the bishop pair like in the queen c2 lines. And recently at a high level, even a move like bishop d2 has been kind of trendy. Again, trying to avoid the doubling of the pawns and potentially win the bishop pair later. So in a lot of ways, white can play it. Although in all the cases, black does equalize with correct play. Usually black ends up going for d5, but sometimes also c5 and b6 are other steps that black can play depending on white's move. And then there are sort of relative sidelines like knight f3 and f3 are also lines that are seen a bit. But again, if black plays it correctly, black will be able to equalize here as well. You know, it's funny actually, with this uh, this video, I actually intended to go uh, make it just one, half an hour covering all the openings, but as you can see, I think it's important to kind of understand the general ideas and what some of the conclusions are and how they sort of came about, and so that's why we're going a little bit deeper. And now we, you know, we've covered the lines with e6. Uh, white well, can also play Catalan with g3, but it does mean that white loses some options against some other lines as a result of trying to avoid the Queen's Indian, as it were. But anyway, if we go to g6, this is of course the, you know, Kingside Fienkeda approach, where black can either choose between the King's Indian or the Grunfeld. And we're going to start with the King's Indian, because King's Indian is more common, especially at, let's say, the amateur level. It's a very, very popular opening, where, of course, after e4, d6, there are a lot of options for white. And again, I can't show you every single one of them, but the main line is basically knight f3, castles and then bishop to e2 
It's known as the classical variation where Y just develops very classically. I kind of wait for Black to determine his style before deciding what to go for accordingly. And so the main line for Black is the Mardel Plata with Knight to C6. There are other moves Black can play like ED4, Knight D7, Knight A6, but in all the cases White does get an advantage with correct play. Whereas the Knight D6 line is still holding strong objectively. I have to admit, when playing these positions, my results with Black were generally quite bad. Why well, I wasn't really a fan of these close positions, but objectively they're certainly quite fine. Where these days the bayonet with b4 going for a very fast queenside attack is the main trend. Whereas the old main line is to go knight e4 and kind of maneuver your knight to a good square and then prepare c5 in this way. Often dispensing with c4 in favour of more peace play. And then you get this sort of, you know, this kind of pawn stomp situation, say f3, f5. This kind of a typical sequence where it's a race between white's queenside attack versus black's attack on the king. Which naturally leads to very, very sharp play. And there are alternatives White can play if he doesn't want to enter this sort of direct, you know, Black going for the pawn storm against the king. Things like the Gligorich, for example, is a possible alternative, though not quite as good as castles in my opinion. Also, there are other systems such as the same-ish with f3, where White will often play moves like bishop e3 and knight e2 and kind of just often go for either a queenside castling setup or just to build a very solid center. For example, in a Benoni kind of position, we could see that, you know, in a structure like this, that white can try to claim a small advantage based on the fact that it's very hard for black to create counterplay against such a solid position like this. And opening three does give white a very small edge at this point, though it is still manageable for black, and black still gets a typical King's Indian activity and initiative that he's looking for. And there's also moves like Bishop E2, which can transpose to the classical after knight F3, but there are also lines like the Avabak with Bishop G5 and the semi back with bishop e3 that also have a right to exist. Now the line is maybe the most trendy alternative to knight f3 at high level is the Makoganov with h3. And nowadays it's normally played with a move bishop to e3, though it is true there are other ways you can play it like knight f3, bishop g5, but the idea is that if you get a structure like e5 and c d5 and this is the main line, well I can sort of play g4 and go for this attacking setup, which makes it very hard for black to get the usual f5 plan that we saw in the King's Indian, you know, the Mardel Plata with, you know, white castling short and knight c6 to e7, yeah? Now black has to find a different source of counterplay against this Makoganov setup, like playing for c6 at some moment. Not now, but you know, probably you'll get the knight to a good square first, but something like this is how it could play out for black. And there are other moves that have been played as well. I mean, there's things like four pawns attack, bishop d3, knight e2, but of course these moves are not really considered as critical as the other lines that I've shown you already. Now, it's also worth pointing out that Black is not limited to playing King's Indian, but also can play to Grunfeld. And, again, I can't show every single line against the Grunfeld because there are just too many things White can go for. You know, moves like Knight F3, Bishop F4, and Bishop G5 are all alternatives that have their own body of theory. But the main line is to play CD5 and to play E4. This is known as the exchange Grunfeld, where White gets a very nice-looking space advantage in the center. But you could also argue that because e4 and c4 are undefended, that this center can be a bit of a weakness that black can in turn attack with his pieces in a very thematic sort of way. Um, you know, often you'll put the rook on d8 and the queen on a5 to attack c3 and d4. So it's up to white to determine his setup to deal with that. One setup is to play knight f3, c5, and then a weird looking move of rook to b1, which is known as the modern exchange variation, which is kind of ironic because now it's sort of it was called modern and now it's sort of considered an old school line. But the idea is that if knight d6 you can often sack a pawn with d5. Because if they take it you get a very strong initiative in the center. And you use the fact that you're not losing a rook on a1 if they take is kind of the point. Though that being said black is doing fine like he can play cd4 or knight c6. Both the lines are considered fine for black. But of course in the Grunfeld very sharp unbalanced opening where both sides but especially black really have to know what they are doing. Which is kind of the reason why it's mostly an opening scene at higher levels of play. There's also other approaches like bishop c4 where you put the knight on e2. So if bishop g4 you go f3 and you kind of put the, the blot on the bishop as it were. And there's also the bishop e3 approach where you develop your queenside pieces first. Like rook c1 knight f3. And just again it's aimed against queen a5 where you try to go d5 and push ahead in the center without blundering the c3 pawn. Is kind of the idea of white setup. It's a line that I was normally playing as a junior, inspired by some great wins by Vladimir Kramnik in 2000s, and also Magnus Carlsen the modern champion who's beaten a lot of the world's best players with this setup as white. 
So that's kind of the overview of the Grunfeld and some different subs you can play. And of course, there are many other moves I didn't get to cover, but it gives you a general idea of why these moves are the main lines at a high level. And there are some players who also will try to avoid the Grunfeld. For example, playing something like G3, the Fiend Keto variation, playing this kind of general setup, against which Black and Ivor choose between playing a King's Indian sub with Castles and, and D6, or the other approach that is perhaps the, I think objectively the most solid, is to play C6 and go for this kind of very symmetrical sort of structure with D4 versus D5, and to putting the blot on the Bishop on G2 with this pawn chain. And there are more sort of maverick approaches, like playing a Grunfeld with D5, or playing as Brunoni style with C5, but his approach I consider slightly better for white according to the theory. By the way, it would be remiss of me not to also point out that white is not limited to playing the move C4, but also there are other approaches like knight F3, where white will then choose some system depending on what black does. So most often knight F3 at high levels is connected with playing something like the London system with bishop F4, which of course could also be played against G6, D5 and, and other moves. Though it's sort of considered slightly less effective against g6 on average. But it's also true that other subs that can be played, for example, here, you might also see white playing, say, g3, playing like a fiend keto variation without, you know, c4, uh, and also other lines where, for example, things like the Torre attack with bishop g5 is another system that can be played against most of black's possible setups here. Uh, and also even other things like, for example, the Cole, which you normally see if black is played like d5 or e6, then this is e3, and you'll often see white play kind of like a semi-slav or a Kole Zucker taught with b3, bishop b2, or with c3 and knight to bd2, depending also on how black plays it as well. And also there are other things like things such as the Tromposki with bishop g5, or the Verasov with knight c3, or, you know, Jabava line with bishop f4 instead of bishop g5 Verasov. But these lines are kind of not as critical, and black is generally... Thought to be fine in multiple ways against these systems. Whereas the knight f3 default terms tend to be a little bit more critical. Which, by the way, brings us to the lines where black plays d5. And we actually already kind of touched on a little bit, for example, after c4 and e6. If I were to play knight f3 in this position, we would actually transpose after knight f6 to the, uh, you know, to the lines that we saw of the d4, knight f6, c4, e6, uh, knight f3, d5 move order, if you remember that one. But of course there are other options white does have the move knight c3 available and you might be asking well, what's the difference between knight c3 and knight f3 and the main difference is if black plays knight f6 which is the classical approach to the position white gets the extra option of playing cd5 the exchange variation and this is a very common rep re recommendation in repertoire books for white with d4 and the reason is that you have this very clear structure and rather than say playing knight f3 and having to prepare for a lot of different options that black can play. We kind of force the type of position on the board, and then if black will, let's say, to play the kind of normal developing moves like knight d7, bishop b7, well, white can choose, depending on black's set, where we all play the positional lines with knight f3, or play the more dynamic Kaspar of Botvinic lines with knight e2, where you play for, like, castles f3 and e4 as the general plan to try to use your central majority more dynamically. Whereas in the lines with knight f3, by contrast, you're kind of more playing more positionally, usually with a minority attack, or going for knight e5 and a Pillsbury plan with f4 to attack on the king's side, or in case of modern three, playing h3, and keeping the option of both plans available, depending on what black does at this point. And this line is sort of thought practically to be a bit better for white, though yeah, it is true that if black plays perfectly, he can hold, but it is very, very comfortable, and this is sort of the reason why many people who want to play the queen's gambit will play the knight f3, f6, e6 move order, in order to play the Nimuso if white goes knight c3, true or true. It is also worth pointing out black does have the triangle system with c6. Some players like to play the semi-slav in this way, trying to get in knight f3 and knight f6, and transpose semi-slav in this fashion. Or if black wants to be independent, there are these sharp lines and note brim with dc4, which can also be very, very unbalanced. Uh, though I do consider them to be a little bit worse than knight f6 and the semi-slav, objectively. But say if white wants to try to avoid dc4, he can play e3 and offer again a transposition of a semi-slab with knight f6 and knight f3, which black doesn't really have a good way to avoid. The attempts like a stonewall are a little bit worse for black in general. And there are also lines like e4, which is actually another martial gambit, where the idea is that you sacrifice the pawn, 
with bishop b4, bishop d2. But the idea is that after queen d4, you get this very strong bishop. You know that obviously black's dark square is very weak. And both bishop b2 and knight e2. I mean, this way you can set some problems. If black memorized all the fear, you can hold the draw. But white's definitely got a strong initiative to work with here on a practical level. So that kind of covers these lines. You know, there are other moves that are seen, like bishop e7 is a move. The tarish was c5. It's also quite common. And then there are weird moves like bishop b4 and a6. But in all these cases, white does get a small advantage with correct play, where their race can try to punish their move orders as such. So anyway, the other major line for black that I consider equivalent to e6 is the move c6. And I'll point out, by the way, I don't think that d5 is objectively worse than i f6, but I do consider it slightly less flexible to some extent. Which is not the same as worse, I just find it a little bit less flexible, and that's why, at a top level, most people do meet d4 with knight f6. But you're turning to the Slav. I mean, with the Slav, the point is that after knight f3, knight f6, that black can use this as a move order to reach a semi-Slav with e6. This is why the semi-Slav gets named, because c6 is a Slav, and e6 is kind of like, you know, building the triangle, you know, the pyramid, as it were. And e6 is the best move. I've found that there are other ways you can play the Slav, like d take c4, where you you know, try to hang on to the pawn or, you know, at the very least, try to get your bishop developed actively while white is in the process of winning back the pawn. But I think that after both the alley conversion, 95, and to a lesser extent, the, you know, Dutch variation with e3, white is a little bit better in both of these cases. Though probably his edge is a little bit greater after 95, in my humble opinion. And it's still the reason why dc4 is not considered as good. There are the lines like the Chepinenko of a6, but again, I think that both e3, and the more ambitious c5 clamping down on the queen side does give white a small pull. So it's kind of a matter of taste in that regard. Uh, of course, it's also worth pointing out if white does want to have extra options against semi-slav. It's also interesting to play e3. Saying that if they go e6, then you have extra options like playing b3 or bishop d3. Where instead of putting knight on c3, you might put the, the knight on d2. And kind of have keep this long diagonal for the bishop. It's a way to try to get a slightly better version of normal semi-slav. And I do think white gets a very tiny advantage to work with here. But it's also where point out black gets extra options as well, of which bishop f5 is probably the best one, or use the fact that white's not got early pressure against the d5 pawn. But also bishop g4 is another move that, while well, I don't think it's quite as good as bishop f5, it's also not that easy for white to prove more than a tiny edge here either. And then there are alternatives, I mean things like, for example, the exchange variation, which is safe for white, but not really considered very critical by Fury for the most part. But of course, there's a line that, that exists. And it's not, let's say, it's vastly worse than, you know, knight f3, knight c3. And finally, there's the queen's gambit accepted. I mean, I'm not going to waste time on, you know, inferior moves like the Chigurin or the martial defense or the, you know, Alban counter gambit or, you know, c5 or the Baltic. I mean, these moves exist, but white gets a pretty clear advantage against all of them. Except maybe c5 and you get a slight advantage if white, you know, knows what he's doing. So I'll just say that these lines are inferior, but the Queen's Gambit accepted. Well, I don't think it's in quite the same league as c6 and e6. It's not that easy to force a clear advantage against it either. The most critical line is probably to play e4 and grab the space. But Black can play e5 and, you know, Levon Aronian actually had some games recently where he played this line where, you know, White sacks the pawn, but Black gets, uh, well, White gets a nice lead in development. And it's one of these lines where Black plays perfectly, can hold, but from a Practical level, it's much easier to play white. You know, bishop b6, you can either take. Or you can play bishop b5. Like, bishop b5 is kind of considered the, the more critical move. And it's kind of a line that starts out quite sharp. We end up in this ending that basically they get these double pawns. And white is a bit better, but black can hold if he plays correctly. So, that's sort of the main reason why dc4 is probably not considered like an absolute main line. There's also other moves available like knight f3. This is the... The old main line where you go e3 and you get back the pawn more quietly. But black also gets to challenge a center in these lines. White has tried a lot of different moves. You know, dc5 is kind of the main line, but moves like bishop b3, b3, a4, knight c3, like all of these moves and even some others have been seen at a high level. But in all cases, black is sort of able to take his marginally worse position and just gradually equalize the game. But dc5 and going for the end game, where you could say white's got a little bit of an initiative, is probably the most critical line according to modern fury at present. As black doesn't really make sure, let's say, 100% equalize right away. But anyway, that's kind of the story of these d5 lines, and as usual, white can also play knight f3, and again, probably the London system is the best of the 
d4 deviations where Y is not playing c4. Of course, there are other lines like e3, g3 that also have been played. But yeah, the London is kind of the, I'd say, strongest alternative to c4. And Black can choose his setup with probably the lines with c5 uh, either just going for an attack like this. Or going for e6 and playing to challenge the bishop instead are kind of the lines that are sort of considered the most reliable equalizer against the London, but it's still a body of theory that is still growing and evolving. And I mean, I think Black's alternatives in general, like to knife 6 and d5, will in general give White a small advantage. The main disadvantage of moves like, let's say, e6 or d6 or g6 being that White does have the option to play e4 and thus transpose into a favorable 1 e4 opening. Uh, so that's not giving back chance, say, transfer to a King's Indian or something. And if we take something like the Dutch defense, again, you know, moves like G3 and just this very classical Catalan sub, just give White a small and very pleasant edge in all of the lines. So, on that base, we can sort of see that, well, well, basically conclusion that D4 can be played in a lot of good ways for both sides. It really comes down to a matter of personal preference, though I have indicated lines I consider, let's say, the most unpleasant for Black, at least according to modern theory, and based on the recent Grandmaster games I've been following. I was so startled by the door creaking open that I dropped my water bottle. Maybe you guys can relate to having your mother over the shoulder and, you know, saying, Are you listening to that eccentric Australian Grandmaster again? Okay, these jokes aside, though, let's consider, just to wrap up, a few of the flank openings. Granted, Knight F3 and C4, these moves are not objectively as strong as the big two e4 and d4 but still it's good to know how to deal with them the main reason by the way why c4 is considered less precise is because of e5 the reverse sicilian and of course there are many ways one could play against the reverse sicilian the main one being to go knight c3 you know bring the four knights out knight f6 knight f3 knight e6 and you know, there are many moves that white has played here you know g3 is the old main line but now the critical continuation is thought to be to play the Nimsvich system with e4, according to a lot of very deep computer games. Also moves like e3, as I'm seen, but in all the cases, though, black man goes to equalize, and it's usually more than one way in which black can maintain the balance, so this is kind of the main reason why you don't really see c4 that much at a high level, unless it's aiming specifically against a particular opening, because let's say the opponent plays, tries to play one of their usual defenses to d4 against c4, whether it's, you know, Nimzo Indian, let's say, King's Indian, Grunfeld, this sort of thing. Well, you can try to play something a little bit different where you don't play d4, but in those cases, you give Black easier equality, objectively speaking, if you just play d4 and c4, yeah? Uh, the move order at Knight F3, though, is one that's a bit more common at a high level than c4, since obviously you're trying to... You're not letting Black play e5, as it were. And if they play d5, which is the most common continuation, as I noted before, like d5 and e6, this is a little more effective on average when white is not, when white is already committed to knight f3, so black is quite happy after d4 transposed to a normal d4 opening. But white can also try to play it his own way, and, you know, the king's Indian attack is the main attempt for white to try to make it sort of interesting, but here as well, black has found many ways to equalize from the more slab approach of, you know, playing c6 and bishop g4, like this is one line, a reverse toy, where black has shown to be able to equalize out too many problems. And there's also some other lines, like, there are too many subs to name all one by one, but also G6. And this sort of Grunfeld sus up is another one that's been shown to be a very reliable equalizer. In fact, because of the idea of E5, White's best move is probably to play D4, but then you transpose to a Fiend, Ketter, or Grunfeld, where White does not really manage to prove any advantage in the lines after cast Castle C4, C6. I mean, White can try a lot of moves, you know, there's B3, CD5... Queen b3 and knight d2 are sort of the big four continuations at white's disposal, but, you know, white gets to choose type position, but objectively black fully equalizes. Whereas so after cd5, for example, white's extra tempo doesn't really give him an actual appreciable advantage, because black is just too solid in such symmetrical position. Uh, but anyway, that's sort of the story there, and, you know, there are other systems that exist, like moves like c4, like the reti, but the reti, though, if black plays d4, you just get this reverse Benoni with either c5, knight e6, or knight e6 and e5, depending on what white does, where black just equalizes with no difficulty whatsoever, which is why c4 is maybe considered not as precise as d4 or g3 here. As for knight to f6, of course, the king's in attack still exists, but more often at a high level, you see white plays c4, and often you'll see them play this as a way to try to move order black out of certain openings. For example, 
to play something like Knight to C3 here, saying that if black plays an Imzo Indian, it's not as good when you're not pinning the pawn. But if black goes D5, well, we move Ordered back into a, you know, standard Queen's Gambit decline, but avoid some things like the Queen's Indian in the process, since B6 would kind of run into E4 and white would get some advantage there. And sometimes you'll see moves like G3, where white tries to play a kind of Neo-Catalan, where, for example, you try to move Ordered black into certain lines while avoiding others. For example, there's no Bishop B4 check. And if black plays DC4, which is kind of considered the main line, along with Bishop B7, well, then Queen A4 works a little bit better without the pawn on D4. Uh, but although it is admittedly still equal, but at least black has to work a little bit more than some of the other lines where the pawn is on D4 as such. Uh, I think mean, nowadays, like, Bishop D7 and C5 are sort of considered the, the reliable equalizer, where you can just, you know, challenge them on this diagonal and have the space to work with and such. Uh, there are other moves also can be played for both sides, but I don't want the video to be too long, yeah? And if they were to play g6 instead once again white can try to move order black into a you know a king's indian with something like bishop g7 e4 and then d4 it's true it's a king's indian where white commit to knight f3 but that is the main line against this opening after all because if black plays something like d5 it's considered again a little bit less strong than a normal grunfeld because when white has not played the move d4 well it means that well white gets some extra options and black doesn't get the usual central pressure Nowadays, a move like h4 is kind of thought to be a little bit better according to theory. Very alpha zero approach to a use the g6 pawn as a hook. Uh, but again, this is quite advanced and not something I think is absolutely essential knowledge for the average player. But it's good to know that this is kind of the way the theory stands. And so because of these sort of practical problems that white can pose, this is the reason why in some case black will play c5 and just transpose the symmetrical English, which is the main extra option that black ob obtains due to white not playing the move d4. And so after knight to c3, again, black kind of has a choice of different options between either playing knight c6 and meeting g3 with d5, which is kind of the, let's say, most reliable attempt for black to try to equalize. And then there are other approaches to try to keep a bit more fight in the position, such as e6 with the intention of playing a hedgehog with g6 and kind of trying to play it really solidly with this kind of thing in many cases. Although, of course, black can also play it other ways, but this is the, you know, technically known as the hedgehog. Where computers give white a small advantage, but it's kind of been shown that black is very solid and can defend. And then there's sort of the kind of Grunfeld style approach, like d5. Basically a Grunfeld without g6 and d4, yeah? So here as well, white can try to benefit from not playing this. Moves like e3 are kind of the, the main trend where you kind of switch back to playing, you know, for a central play. And showing that you're not limited to playing g3 in the English. And here as well, I mean, black equalizes, but he doesn't really get a normal Grunfeld type of position as such. So there are different ways to kind of move order in this sort of thing. And there are other moves as well that we don't have time to, to address, but this is sort of the main disadvantage of move order, the fact that black can play c5, and it's true, you can even play c5 here. Though once again, I consider it very slightly less precise than going knight f6 or d5 as such. Uh, I mean, you can play c4 and still play symmetrical English, you know, where knight f3 is kind of the critical line regardless. So yeah, that's kind of the break down these lines and I did realize that one line I did forget to mention earlier is that after c4 black can also play the Benoni with c5 or Budapest Gambit with e5 but I decided not to cover these moves because I think it's just too easy for white to gain advantage white just gets too much space to center and lines like the Benko Gambit are kind of well known to not really give black full compensation if white just grabs the pawn and defends well from there so that's why I decided not to really talk about it separately just except to just mention it just for the sake of completeness but it's definitely not the strongest opening for black. So yeah, with this, we've actually completed the overview. Well, it was meant to be 30 minutes, but it ended up being over 50 minutes. But yeah, glad that you guys enjoyed the video. You're well done on getting through it. And also, well, make sure I say in the comments below, what is if these openings is your favorite one for white? And which of these openings is your favorite one for black that you want to start playing or maybe keep playing? Let me know in the comments below. As always, you can check out the next video that's up there on the suggested videos for you. And you can also subscribe to my channel with more videos. Clicking that red subscribe button is just one simple click. And I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.